I'm Marty Stauffer. It began as a great idea, the American dream. The rugged individuals who pursued it let nothing stand in their way. They were determined to conquer the wilderness. Over the years, the dream came true, but it took a heavy toll on our land, air, water, and wildlife. Even our national symbol, the bald eagle, had to pay the price for progress. This magnificent bird is now in danger of disappearing forever. Today, the list of endangered species, those near extinction in the wild, is growing at an alarming rate. We have enacted laws and imposed fines to protect them but man's destruction goes on. Habitat loss, in general, is probably the major cause of the rapid decline of wildlife. Many of the endangered species in this program have never been filmed before. Without our concern and help, many may never be filmed again. They now stand at the crossroads. When our ancestors arrived in America, this vast land was teeming with life. But man wanted ranches and farms. Prairie dogs ate the grass he wanted for his livestock and occupied the land he wanted for his crops. They were in the way of progress. So using grains soaked in poison, man killed them by the millions. The land is ours, but because of our poison, the black-footed ferret is now the rarest animal in America. Miraculously only rare, not extinct. Ferrets had depended on prairie dogs for their food and had used prairie dog burrows for their homes. Both species are almost gone, but the poisoning continues. To ward off the insect, we spray insecticides. They don't always attack the insect, but they do always enter the food chain. Today, the brown pelican struggles for renewal. The bald eagle is considered endangered, as is the peregrine falcon the fastest bird alive, diving at speeds up to 200 miles per hour. The osprey, too, must fight to survive. We have banned the use of the pesticide DDT, which washed into our waterways and collected in the bodies of fishes, a major food for these predatory birds. They received concentrated and often lethal doses of the pesticide 
by being at the top of the food chain. The brown pelican, for instance, now one of the world's best studied birds. DDT in the food chain caused the pelican's eggs to become fragile or infertile, and their numbers fell drastically. The 1972 ban on DDT helped them back on the road to health, and in California, their recovery is a major ecological success story. But it isn't over yet. Even now, traces of DDT persist in the environment, and not every country has banned the pesticide. No animals arouse our emotions like the large predators. The grizzly bear symbolizes everything wild and free. We admire the mountain lion's beauty and strength. The timber wolf's bravery and intelligence. Yet our admiration doesn't always include concern and protection. We have systematically eradicated these predators with a vengeance that goes far beyond their threat to our life or property. Red wolves now exist only in captivity. This subspecies, the smallest in the world, clings desperately to plans for recovery through captive breeding programs. Over the years, thousands were trapped and shot because they occasionally took domestic livestock. We completely overlooked their value in the wild as predators, consuming carrion, rodents, and other pests, and controlling the health and numbers of their prey. There are no more red wolves left to persecute. And today, the red wolf's lonely howl in the wild exists only on film. Left alone, nature constantly renews itself. The hunters and the hunted live in balance. They regulate each other. For one to live, the other must die. There is no cruelty here. Death, in the interest of survival, is a natural act. for sport alone, with no need for a creature's flesh, fur, or hide, upsets all natural order. Man is the only animal that kills for pleasure. We need no longer fear these mighty creatures, because man himself has emerged as the greatest predator of all.
100 years ago, the tall grass prairie resounded with life as Atwater's greater prairie chickens performed their ritualized courtship. Today, 99% of them are gone. We no longer have prairie chickens because we no longer have prairie. Instead, we have our farmland and our livestock. In forests, too, the same basic theory applies. To shelter its nest, the Kirtland's warbler must have young jack pines. Without them, it cannot reproduce. The destruction and commercialization of natural caves has caused Indiana bats to decline by the hundreds of thousands. Mexican ducks are disappearing forever as our natural rivers are dredged and channelized. The Pecos gambusia represents only one of the many fishes dying from water pollution. The Florida manatee, American crocodile, key deer, Florida panther, and Everglade kite are all threatened by human development on the Florida Peninsula. The same holds true all across America. In California, our runaway progress endangers the San Joaquin kit fox, California least tern, California condor, and salt marsh harvest mouse. Destruction of natural habitat has become the major problem facing all wildlife. All these creatures need is a place where they can live in peace and raise their young. Biologists are working to understand the ways in which this need can be met. The problems are simple. The solutions are difficult. This one's empty, you choose it. The purpose of this study is to learn something about the Delmarva fox squirrel. We know almost nothing about this species, which used to occur abundantly through Pennsylvania, Delaware, the eastern shore of Maryland, and possibly New Jersey. Fox squirrel has declined over all of its range till it's now found on only portions of four counties on Maryland's eastern shore. And unless something is done to encourage this animal, it may disappear before the end of the century. We have about 100 boxes in this woodlot, and they are visited several times a year. This time we try to learn something about how many young they have and when they have these young. This squirrel is a large squirrel, about twice the size of a gray squirrel, and possibly the largest squirrel of North America. The primary reason the fox squirrel has declined is the loss of the habitat due to cutting of forests and the increase in farms. Unless something is done to halt this change, the Delmarva fox squirrel's time on Earth is very short. The Morabe kangaroo rat is found in habitat like this. These are old dune terraces, sand dunes originally, that are covered now with vegetation. And although kangaroo rats in general usually occur in desert regions, here at Morro Bay, they're quite near the coast. The area here being near the coast is very desirable for people to live and much of the area is being built up by homes, shopping centers, and the like. As a result, this kind of vegetation is going to be destroyed, and with it, the habitat for the kangaroo rat. 
We've been conducting a study for the Department of Fish and Game on the Morbay kangaroo rat using live traps of this type to learn something about their population. In this one, we seem to have captured a young adult. Our normal procedure is to transfer them to a sack so that we can examine them more closely. Once we get them in the sack, we have to grab them from the outside and then carefully work the sack back. And here he is. Now, in order to uh, mark the animal, we'll trim the tail. The hair is on the end of the tail so that we can recognize if we've caught him again. Doesn't hurt him any, but at least we know that we've caught him before. And then we can make sure we've got all the information we have on him, and then we can let him go. They live in burrows in the sandy soil. Although they don't have very large front legs, they can dig the burrows in this loose sandy soil uh, with their hind feet and do a pretty effective job of it. In time, when the entire area is developed, there perhaps may be no kangaroo rats left at all. Hopefully that won't happen, but in the meantime, why we consider the kangaroo rat as an endangered form. This is a nestling red cockaded woodpecker. These birds are rare, found only in the southeastern United States. They're considered endangered because the birds require a mature pine woodlands. This type of habitat is disappearing in the southeastern United States. At the present time, the species perhaps numbers only around 3,000 birds. This may be an overestimate. I'm studying the ecology of these birds and. Particularly, I'm interested in their habitat requirements. We think we know a lot about the bird, but we're finding out that there's a lot we don't know. In studying these birds, we have to know how many individuals are in a colony, and we have to know what sexes they are and what ages they are. So we're capturing them and banding them and marking them with colored bands and sometimes with colored dye so that we can tell a particular individual and where that individual is from. We capture these individuals in nets that we string high up in trees on ropes. We capture them in nests by climbing the trees and extracting them with a small nylon noose. We try to get the young birds because these birds, we know how old they are and we know where they're from, but we still try to get the adult birds too. We also try to recapture birds that we have banded so that we can measure their growth, measure differences that are seasonal, differences between the sexes. Probably the primary reason the red cockaded woodpecker has become endangered is because of the current forestry practices in the southeastern United States. The red cockaded woodpecker needs all ages of trees. It forages in the young trees, it nests in the old trees, and if we are to save the species, we need to start practicing selective cutting instead of clear cutting. There is more and more pressure now on our federal lands to cut timber, to practice clear cutting because of our current shortages of, of lumber and, and pulpwood. And we've got to head off these practices, or these pressures, if we're going to save the species. We hold their fate in our hands, as we did the fate of their relative, the ivory-billed woodpecker. In 1935, an expedition headed by Dr. Arthur Allen searched the wilds of Louisiana for this rare bird. After many months, the dedicated ornithologists located the ivory bill and photographed the rarest creature on Earth for the last time ever. Today, the ivory-billed woodpecker is probably extinct. At least 40 other American species are also extinct. The Gull Island Vole, buried by human garbage. Labrador Duck, extinct 
1875, Great Auk, overhunted into oblivion. The Eastern Elk, Stellar Sea Cow, and Sea Mink, all gone forever. Plains Wolf, eliminated to protect livestock. Passenger Pigeon, that classic example. Heath Hen, extinct 1932. Carolina Parakeet, overhunted. And the Badlands Bighorn. To see these drawings and then try to conjure what we've lost is to see a single wildflower and try to imagine a vast field blooming beyond the horizon. So finally we come to the heart of the problem. Our civilization pushes on and closes in on the few remaining wild areas. We are competing with the other inhabitants of this land for space to live, and we are winning. Millions of acres of wildlife habitat are taken each year for our highways, housing, and industry. A number of wilderness areas and wildlife refuges have been set aside, places where many survivors are now making their last stand. Government and private agencies work to save wildlife habitat, but each day the losses outweigh the gains. We should seriously consider preserving even more protected areas. In the development of our country, many wild areas were destroyed and many life forms sacrificed. Attempts are now being made to replenish some of these losses. Southern Arizona and most of Sonora, the Mexican state south of Arizona, were beautiful grassland habitats such as we see here today. In about 1870, the number of cattle was increased from about 5,000 to over a million when the cattle industry became big business here. As a result, the area was changed drastically from the grassland that we see here to a very overgrazed, almost pavement-like area. It got so bad that thousands of cattle died, and uh, at the same time, the wildlife suffered too. Uh, one of the most hard-hit species was the masked Bob White, which is a cousin of the eastern Bob White. And although the populations were never large, as far as we can reconstruct it, they were essentially gone from Arizona by 1900. People became quite concerned about them and decided that something needed to be done. So the Bureau of Sport Fisheries and Wildlife decided to uh, send a biologist to Arizona, which was when I came in 1967. It took years of study, then capture of breeding stock in Mexico, then years of patience, as their numbers grew from a few pair to more than a thousand. Finally, the birds were reintroduced into their native land. In the years since the release, the Bob White's numbers have risen and then fallen, and they are still an endangered species. But the positive side of the story is that they are reestablished in their former habitat. Pooping cranes were once virtually gone, their total population down to only 14. With special refuge areas and protective laws, their numbers tripled, not entirely out of danger, but at least not extinct. If man had not decided to save the hooping crane, they would certainly have vanished. To some, their rarity is a source of curiosity. Now, folks, I'd like to welcome you aboard the boat hooping crane. I hope you enjoy yourself. There are 59 hooping cranes uh, this year. And you're just in luck on this trip. 
this time of year where they start their mating days. Also, you're going to see them exercising their wings, getting them ready for that long flight, 2,500 miles. The loss of the hooping cranes would be much more than the loss of a novelty. They represent wildlife's struggle to survive in our civilized world. They are a beautiful, living example of an endangered species making a dramatic comeback. Other creatures that have also been rescued are the trumpeter swan, pronghorn antelope, sea otter, and desert bighorn. Hundreds of others still face extinction. But many of our endangered species can continue to share the earth with us if we all care enough and act now. We'll not only be helping them, because we share the natural environment with wildlife, any change in the land, air, or water affects us both. Most of these wild creatures are much more sensitive to a polluted environment. Wildlife acts as an environmental barometer. By saving wildlife, we may very well be saving all of mankind. What happens to them will, in turn, happen to us. Our choice of action will determine the future of all life on Earth. Once a species is extinct, nothing can bring it back. We'll never know the secrets that it held. There are some who think that building one more dam here and one more highway there is man's highest purpose on this planet. So now the Endangered Species Act, designed to protect these animals, is itself endangered by development interests. I think these rare creatures must be protected, even at the expense of our so-called progress. We must keep the Endangered Species Act strong, not only for them, but also for the protection of our own environment. We all now stand at the crossroads. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.